أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى الفرج We will examine tradition 2.1.4 on page 19 of our book. We are examining the book of knowledge. Knowledge is one of the important, most, the, one of the most important virtues that a believer must pursue. And it is the most important factor that develops the intellect. Knowledge is an obligation. Seeking knowledge is a religious Islamic obligation on every Muslim man and woman. Let's examine this very interesting hadith attributed to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Briefly, we examine the chain of this hadith. Ali ibn Muhammad, he is one of the teachers of a Shaykh al kulaini He was a scholar. وَغَيْرُهُ and some others. A Shaykh al kulaini does not tell us who they are, but he's just saying, my teacher Ali ibn Muhammad, along with others, have narrated this hadith عن سهل ibn Ziyad from Sahl ibn Ziyad. He is a narrator and a companion who narrated a lot of the hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt. Is he reliable or not? We've examined this before. Briefly, there is a disagreement among scholars. Some of them say he is reliable and one of the proofs that he is reliable is that al kulaini narrates so many hadith through Sahl ibn Ziyad, hundreds of hadiths, in fact close to a thousand hadiths. So if a Shaykh al kulaini who was such an expert and he was so meticulous with his narrations, if he's got 1,000 of his narrations, they go through Sahl ibn Ziyad, that tells us that he, see, he saw him as being reliable. That is an indication that Sahl ibn Ziyad is reliable. Others have said no. Sahl is not reliable because you have scholars like Najashi who was an expert in the science of hadith and biography. He for example says Sahl ibn Ziyad would exaggerate, he may have forged some narrations. So there is a dispute among scholars. Some scholars believe he was reliable, others believe he wasn't. Now for this particular hadith, that's not the only path that al kulaini shares with us. Then he says, Wa Muhammad ibn Yahya. In fact, there are three chains for this hadith. The first one is Ali ibn Muhammad from Sahl ibn Ziyad. That's one way through, through which al kulaini gets the hadith. The second way, because he says Wow and Muhammad ibn Yahya and Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa. So he narrates this hadith from Ali ibn Muhammad, his teacher, and also from Muhammad ibn Yahya, who was also one of his teachers. That's the second chain that Kulaini is using. So Muhammad ibn Yahya, reliable, and Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa, reliable. He's, he's got a third chain as well. So Kulaini received this hadith from three sources. He narrates this, all of them, Jami'an, they narrate this, and ibn Mahbub. Ibn Mahbub is reliable and Hisham Ibn Salim. Hisham Ibn Salim is also a reliable companion of the Imams. And Abi Hamza, Abu Hamza Thimali, the famous Abu Hamza. We recite Dua Abu Hamza in the month of Ramadan. This Dua comes through this companion. He was the companion of a number of Imams and he is reliable. And Abi Ishaq as sabii Abu Ishaq al sabii is anonymous. We don't know much about him. We don't know if he was reliable or not. So that will break the chain because we have an anonymous narrator here. Amman haddathahu. The other problem is that Abu Ishaq al sabii he does not tell us who he's narrating this hadith from. He said, someone told me. He does not reveal the identity of his source. There are a number of reasons we've examined before why you would not reveal the identity of your source. 
Sometimes you don't want to get that source in trouble because of the authorities at the time who were hostile to the Shia and the Ahlul Bayt. They see that you're narrating a hadith from someone, he's a source of knowledge, they would go after him. That could be one reason. Another reason, maybe he forgot. He knows he got this hadith from a trusted source, he just forgot who. So he says, from some one of the companions of the Imams, I don't know exactly who, so I'm not going to reveal his identity. In any case, if we look at the chain of the hadith, it's a broken chain. So we cannot say the chain itself is sahih. So we have to look at other clues to determine whether the hadith is reliable or not. So scholars look at what? The content. The content is compatible with the Quran and it is in line with other ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. So scholars have determined that it's a correct hadith. Because remember as we said before, the chain is only one clue that tells you whether the hadith is authentic or not. We need to look at other clues. Some people what they're doing today, they look at a chain of narration, they find a break in it, an anonymous narrator, oh this hadith is da'if, throw it out the window. That's not how it works, look at the content. Kulaini had you know, very authentic sources when he narrates this hadith. In any case, this hadith is from Al-Imam. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. What does the Imam say? Ayyuhal nas, O people, notice that the Imam is not only speaking to Muslims here. He's not saying, O oh, you who believe, O oh, Muslims. Ayyuhal nas, that is the most general declaration you can make. Everyone's included in the Imam's address. I'lamu anna kamal al-deen talabu al-ilm. You want to achieve the completion of faith? We all claim we have faith. But the Imam says, do you want that full, absolute faith? Know that your religion will not be complete except if you seek knowledge. There's a direct correlation, relationship between knowledge and the level of your faith. The more you seek knowledge, the more you know, the higher your faith is, the more complete your faith is. And the most successful human being is the one who dies with complete knowledge, with complete faith. So there's one path that really takes you to high levels of faith and that is knowledge. But then the Imam السلام, states another condition, if you want your faith to be complete, it's not enough only to have knowledge. There's a second component to it upon it, acting upon your knowledge. What's the point of having knowledge and not acting upon it? That's like a person who goes, goes to medical school, they get straight A's in all of their classes and they pass everything, then when it comes the time for them to be a doctor, to do their residency, they sit home and do nothing. What have they achieved? What have you achieved? Yes, it was good that you got all that knowledge, but you're supposed to use that knowledge. So the one who gains knowledge but does not act upon it, does not implement it himself or herself, will have incomplete faith. So the Imam says to have complete faith, seek knowledge. Number two, act upon it. Everything that you learn, write it on a piece of paper, you know, hang it on your refrigerator somewhere else, on your <laughs> desktop, your office, act upon it. Make a goal for yourself, I've learned something. My challenge in this month is to act upon this. Next month, challenge yourself with something else. Take it step by step. A lot of people, they just want to enact everything in one day. You can't sometimes. Take it step by step, do it for a while until it becomes a natural habit. Then move on to the next step, to the third step. Then the Imam السلام, makes a very interesting comparison between ilm, knowledge and mal, money or wealth. The Imam السلام, states, أَلَا وَإِنَّ طَلَبَ الْعِلْمِ أَوْجَبُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ طَلَبِ الْمَالِ Know, O people, that seeking knowledge is a greater obligation, it's more critical than seeking wealth than seeking sustenance, seeking money. Why? The Imam gives us very important insight 
into how the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. The Imam السلام, makes it very clear in this hadith that when it comes to your sustenance, your rizq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed that for you. Rizq in the religion of Islam is not only an amount of money, a quantity, it's the quality of life. That money which you need to have a functional life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed it for you. Now that doesn't mean you don't work, no, Allah says work. But realize, Assalamu alaikum, realize that I have already determined the wealth that will benefit you and the money that you will make. You know that's determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have many narrations and verses in the Quran about that. Some people think it's only through their effort. Allah says, yes, work, but I decide in the end how much money you will make and more importantly, how beneficial that money is for you. A lot of times people make millions, but then look at their quality of life. Just a very, very quick example, look at the lives of singers and musicians. Because there's one hadith from Imam Ali السلام, in which he states, وَكَثْرَةُ الْإِسْتِمَاعِ إِلَى الْغِنَاءِ Being exposed constantly to music, يُورَثُ الْفَقْرِ Leads to poverty. A lot of people are looking at a statement like this, they're like, wait a minute. When we look at society today, one of the wealthiest people are those musicians and singers. They've got millions. How is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, stating that constant exposure to singing and the music industry will lead to poverty? Well, what type of poverty is the Imam Ali السلام, referring to? There's types of poverty. You could have millions, but if those millions are not giving you a quality of life, that's not richness. And look at the lives of singers and musicians. One of the highest rates of depression and suicide in the professional fields in our society are found where? Amongst musicians and singers. Every once in a while you hear a singer committing suicide. Why? They had billions, millions, they have fame, they have reputation, they have fans. What more do you want in this life? Ask the average person, what's your goal in life? Money and fame, what else do you want? And fans who are willing to kill themselves for you. Yet, they suffer the highest rates of depression and suicide. That's poverty. When your money is not helping you live a quality life. That's why the Imam Ali Salam states, constant exposure to singing and the music industry leads to poverty. See that money that they're making is not really rizq, because rizq is beneficial money. The singer is making 50 million dollars, but that's not benefiting them. They have this void in their lives. I really invite you to go tonight and research the lives of singers. You will be shocked. Just look at the statistics and look at their personal stories. Most of them do not have a stable life. Most of them don't. We usually look at things from the outside, it looks glamorous and beautiful. But just go deeper into their lives. To give you one quick, um, you know, some quick statistics here, statistics here and some figures and numbers, in the UK, 19% of the average population suffer from depression. 19%, which is a lot, that's one fifth of the population. Out of every five, British people, one is suffering from chronic depression. We're not talking about temporary depression. You know, every once in a while something might happen, we could get depressed. That's normal. We're talking about de depression as a disease, an ongoing problem. Do you know what the rate is among, amongst musicians and singers in the UK? 71%. That's three times more, more than three times than the average population. Average population 19%, singers and musicians in the UK, 71% of them suffer from this. Here's the hadith of Imam Ali السلام, when he says it leads to poverty. So when we talk about rizq and sustenance and all those hadith and verses about rizq and sustenance, always keep this in mind. When Allah says, I've guaranteed that rizq for you, or if you do this act, it increases your sustenance. Allah's not talking about a figure. 10 million, 5 million, no. 
Allah is talking about quality of life. You could have $100,000, but your life is at a much higher quality than a singer who has $50 million. Because at night, at least you sleep peacefully. Yes, you may have had a long day, stressful life, but at least you sleep peacefully. That in itself is something those millions of dollars cannot buy for you. That's rizq. In addition to all of that, your akhirah. Any money in this world that keeps you away from the hereafter and becomes a burden on you in the hereafter because you spent it in the haram way or in a useless way, that's not rizq really because that's a burden. Another aspect to consider rizq, your children and their future. Sometimes you could have millions, but if Allah does not put blessings in them, what happens to your progeny and your children? Whereas some people, they might not have that much money, but Allah blesses their progeny. That's a type of rizq. Having good children is a type of sustenance. So keep all that in mind when you hear about these hadiths that state Allah has guaranteed the sustenance for you. You make the effort, you work, but in the end, how much you'll benefit from that money depends on a number of factors and in the end is decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some people in this world, they work themselves to death. I've seen people like that. They barely see their children, family members, they ruin their health. They work like 20 hours, 18 hours to make that extra money. Islam says it's good to work, but don't overwork yourself. Why? You don't, you don't trust that Allah will give you and deliver to you. Sometimes we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives the sustenance. The religion of Islam says be moderate, work, but don't kill yourself in the process of working. There are some people who really overwork themselves. Be moderate about it. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed for you this sustenance. Working more is not going to increase the beneficial wealth that you have. It's not going to. It's just a waste of time really. How many instances have I seen in every community that you go to, you'll see this, of people, of you know, parents, of a father who was really hard working. Some of them work like, I don't know, 15 hours a day. They deny themselves the pleasures of this life. They go through so much stress, they barely see their families and they make those millions and millions. They keep adding up on their bank accounts. They never benefit from that money. They die, their children take that money and they waste it within few months or years. And oftentimes on either useless things or haram things. Is this rizq? You work yourself to death accumulating those millions but Allah did not put barakah in it because you didn't follow the path that He gave you. You did not observe the factors that He gave you. And then your children came. And what did, what did they do with that wealth? They squandered it. They wasted it. On the day of judgment, the burden is on you. Allah will tell you, you made that money. How did you spend it? And others benefited from it. Benefited, enjoyed it in this world. That's not rizq. I know a lot of parents will come and say, yeah, but Sayyid, I have to secure the future of my children. Habibi, who told you you have to secure the, ch the future of your children? There's no God, khalas. In this, uh, you, you, be, you, you took God's seat and now you want to give rizq to the people? Islam says be responsible, give your children a proper education, proper upbringing. Don't be so concerned what's going to happen after you die. They don't have God. Yani God decided to give you but He's going to deny your children. What kind of a God is that? Many people forget that. No, I have to, before I die, I have to give them a house and I have to give them X amount of money. Who told you? This reveals a weakness in your faith towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will take care of your children. That's something we constantly forget. So Islam says don't overwork yourself. And there are very important factors in increasing your rizq. Many of us don't do it. One of the factors that increase the rizq is being awake between fajr and sunrise, dawn and sunrise, like from 6 to 7.30 a.m. these days. Because the angel Mikail, who's responsible for distributing the rizq for the people, does that at that time. The more you 
pray during this time, the more you supplicate, the more rizq Allah gives you that day, that month and that week. That's something most people are oblivious to. That's one way to increase your rizq. There's many ways, many factors. I'm just sharing with you one of those factors. We have beautiful hadiths that tell you exactly how God will increase that sustenance that's beneficial for you. So the Imam السلام, in this hadith says, when it comes to money, you're guaranteed God has taken care of you. God has taken care of you. Work, don't overwork yourself. But in the end, God will deliver to you the sustenance like He does to all of His creation. Even the ant and the animals and the cells and the microbes, they all get their sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every type of animal, look at them out there in the world, they're getting their sustenance. Now we'll talk about starvation and hunger and those people who starve. Does, does that mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not giving them sustenance? We'll get to that in a few minutes. But the general concept here is that Allah has given you a guarantee that He'll take care of you and your rizq and your, you know, uh, th that, that aspect of your life. However, when it comes to seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not said, I will deliver that knowledge to you regardless, I've guaranteed that. No. Allah says knowledge is what is preserved or as the translator says, it is stashed away with its keepers. You have to go search for it and acquire it. Rizq is going to come to you. Don't worry about the rizq. It's going to come to you. Allah has guaranteed that for you. But when it comes to knowledge, no, there's no such guarantee. Allah says you work for it. I'm not going to deliver knowledge to you like I deliver your sustenance. That is not something I've guaranteed. So every bit of knowledge that you need, you have to earn it. You have to work for it. So the Imam السلام, states, إِنَّ الْمَالَ مَقْسُومٌ مَضْمُونٌ لَكُمْ Wealth, money, has been apportioned, guaranteed for you. قَدْ قَسَمَهُ عَادِلٌ بَيْنَكُمْ one who is fair and just has apportioned it among you and guaranteed it, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, the just one, He has guaranteed that the rizq will come to you. Quick question here. How come then when we see in some parts of the world people starve to death? Why is it the case? Or why do we even have poor people? Why couldn't God just give everybody an equal amount of money? See, while this, the overall system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to deliver to you your sustenance, but because life is a test and Allah is testing us, sometimes Allah allows us human beings to do injustice to one another to test us. All those people who starve is not because God has limited His sustenance, it's because of the injustice. Because there are dominant powerful people denying them their sustenance. Let me give you a, just a quick example. Let's say you are supposed to receive your morning newspaper every day, just a small example here. It's delivered to you, it's de delivered to your mailbox actually at 6 a.m. You open your door to read the paper at 7 a.m. At 6.30, every day somebody comes and he takes it away from you. He steals the paper from you. Is it the mailman's fault? Is it the company's fault that you subscribe to? Let's say you subs you've subscribed for the New York Times. It gets delivered every day. Did the New York Times do an act of injustice to you because you're not getting your paper? No. Is the mailman somehow responsible? No. Then why did you not receive your paper? Act of injustice. There is an evil intention, an evil player in the, in the game, in the picture, who denied you that right. And we have hadiths from the Ahlul Bayt that anytime a person goes hungry, it's because their right has been denied. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give them enough sustenance. The resources God has given to us on earth is more than sufficient. But then you've got people who are greedy and they are unjust, they oppress one another. That's where the problem is. Now yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have stopped them and everyone from doing injustice, but remember we're here for a test. Allah's testing us. 
The oppressor, he's tested on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seek revenge from the oppressor. And the oppressed, Allah will compensate them. If they remain patient and they accept the will of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will reward them with the highest levels of paradise. So there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for this disparity in income and wealth. If everyone was rich and they had the same level of wealth, you think we'd have a functional society? Who would do some jobs that no one is willing to do? If everyone had an equal amount of wealth, we couldn't live properly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of His system, He's made us in need to one another. Because once you're in need, you have now a relationship with people. Now, there is a lot of room for you to commit acts of injustice. Allah is watching you. Allah is testing you. And that's why we have many narrations that tell us those rich people, whom Allah has given them a lot of wealth. Allah tells them in many narrations and verses of the Quran that you are responsible for the poor. I've appointed you to be my representatives when it comes to the poor. Because Allah has numerous ways of delivering sustenance to you. Rumors, sometimes Allah sends down the rain and the crops grow, that's your sustenance. Allah gives you health, you go and work, that's sustenance. Allah sometimes combines numerous factors, you become lucky as they say, and you make money. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the money to a wealthy person. And the poor person, their money is with that wealthy person. They're like the mailman who's supposed to deliver the paper. What happens is sometimes that mailman doesn't deliver it. Allah has numerous ways of sending wealth and rizq to people. Wealthy people, they think they own their money. They don't own their money. If Allah gave you wealth, a lot of them, that, that money is, does, is, does not even belong to you. It's an amana, it's a trust that God gave in your hands and He has directly asked you, deliver it to the people. Many people don't. Many people don't. And that's a great act of injustice. You know how great of an act of injustice when we don't pay our religious dues to the, to the poor? Let's say I want to give you a gift. I come here, you have, see I, there is no obligation on me. I'm giving you a gift. I give you a thousand dollars. Here's a gift. Now in addition to this thousand dollars, I tell you and I have a request from you. There's two hundred dollars. Please give it to so and so person. Can you? You take the $1,000, it's halal, completely yours, and it's a favor that I've done for you. My only request was, take this $200 and give it to that person. If this person takes the gift of $1,000, and they also take the $200, how do you view such person? How do you view such a person? Greedy. It's not only greed. It's a and, and, and it's the worst type of thief, right? Because you're gifting that thief. See, an average anonymous thief whom you don't know, okay fine, they don't know, they break into your house, they take something. But sometimes your friend, you're good to them, you give them $1,000 and you tell them, just deliver this and they steal it. That theft is greater. Because now you've done a favor on this person. It's so much more wrong for them to steal from you. So much more wrong than somebody who doesn't even know you. Right? Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you feel betrayed? Of course you would feel betrayed. You're like, I was good to you. I actually entrusted you. Let's look at the world today. Anyone who denies the poor from their rightful dues, from their religious dues, is like this person. Allah has given them life, sustenance, everything. Allah says, with, with the zakat for example, those people who zakat applies to, Allah says, I just want 2.5%. I've given you 97.5%. 2.5, give it to the poor. They deny it. Or when it comes to the khums, which is applicable, Allah says, 80% is yours. $800 is for you. 200, give it to those who, who need it. We deny him that. Imagine this act of betrayal. It's a big, big act of betrayal. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His system allows for this 
to test us on the Day of Judgment. He'll tell us, I tested you, I gave you free will, and this is how you acted. It's part of that test. And whenever we take a test, for example, a multiple choice test, you've all taken it, right? There's a question, answers to choose from. From those answers, you've got usually four or five options, right? Out of those options, how many, how many is right? Just one. What about the rest? Wrong. They're wrong. Who put those wrong answers? Who put them in the test? Those wrong answers. Teacher. teacher, why? I thought the teacher is supposed to teach you truth and facts. Why did they put wrong stuff in your test? Why? Test, test you. And usually you see the wrong answers, they're more than the right answer. There's just one right answer and all that wrong. But that's how a test works. If it was the opposite, that wouldn't be a real test. You've got five answers, four are right, just one is wrong. People are like, okay, come on, you know, that's not a real test. Give me a real test, right? That's why in the world there's only one Sirat al mustaqim It's that one right answer. But the paths that take you to evil, they can be many. But there's only one right path. See, when it comes to just a simple multiple choice uh, test, we understand that. Well, take that same concept and apply it to religion and faith and what's right. So, the Imam السلام, in this hadith is telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is delivering the sustenance to us and dividing it and apportioning it, Allah is just. Don't think that if there's some injustice here and there, it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is denying you your right. No. People are coming acts of injustice and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you. It goes back to that idea of the test. وَسَيَفِي لَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will eventually give you your sustenance. When it comes to knowledge, however, وَالْعِلْمُ مَخْزُونٌ عِنْدَ أَهْلِهِ Knowledge, on the other hand, is stashed away with its keepers. وَقَدْ أُمِرْتُمْ بِطَلَبِهِ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ And you have been ordered to seek it from its keepers. فَطْلُبُوهُ So go and seek that knowledge. Therefore, the Imam السلام, is making a very important point here. Don't sit there thinking that knowledge is going to come to you one day. That's not going to happen. Sustenance will come to you, but not knowledge. Knowledge is stored. See, the Imam even uses the word makhzun. In Arabic, when you put something away in a closet, in a box, you call that makhzun. That means it's not easily accessible. Knowledge is not easily accessible. Because it requires a lot of effort. You have to go after knowledge. Even in this age where you have all that information, see, information is easily accessible, but true knowledge that benefits, because the Imam says, seek knowledge from its rightful people. Not every knowledge is beneficial. In fact, there is harmful information. The Imam السلام, says, if you want to seek that pure knowledge from its correct sources, you have to work for it. You have to earn it. It's a journey that you really have to give priority in your life. You have to make a lot of effort to receive that divine knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that in this beautiful hadith, the Imam alayhi salam makes a beautiful comparison between knowledge and between wealth and money. And he gives us that difference between them. Any questions or comments on this hadith? I just have a question um, about you said earlier about homes. Is, is it um, obligated for, is it 20%? Is that like a legit number? Yes, because khums is one-fifth, which is 20%. And the 20% is not on all the money that you make. It's not on the income that you make. It's on what you make as a profit at the end of the year. So you designate a year for you. Let's say it starts first of Ramadan, first of January. You see how much do you make from this January till the next January. Let's say you made... $50,000, but you spent forty dollars on your expenses, on yourself, on your family, on your travels, on your food, on your clothing, on all those expenses. You spent $40,000. At the end of the year, how much do you have on the side that you did not use? Ten, right? If you made fifty. That ten in Islamic law is considered the ribh, profit, because that's money that you made and you did not use, so it's profit. That 20% applies to that. 
So 20% of 10,000. Of the 10, which is 2,000. So see, you made 50,000 that year, but you only paid 2,000. You give it to well, the Qur'an and the Ahadith designate where it must go to. We have half of it which is called Sahm al sada That portion is given to Sayyids from the progeny of the Prophet who are poor. The second half is called Sahm al-Imam. It goes to any project that the Imam السلام, or the representative of the Imam authorizes. So any projects that strengthen the faith, such as the seminaries, mosques, orphanages, anything that is also charitable, hospitals that are non-profit organizations, they have a license, let's say from the marja, it goes, it's spent on that. Like, who do you give it to first and then they pass it out, right? Well, you can either give it to the representative of your marja or to any charitable project that is licensed by the scholars. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of orphanages, hospitals, mosques, Schools that do have those licenses, you can give it to them. Okay, like here, you could give it. To yeah, anywhere, anywhere. There, are in in every, pretty much every community, you have a, a, a range of projects and institutions that are licensed. Yes. Say one other question. Let's say you don't make like nothing, like your income is bad the whole year. You know, تعيش ولادك. Does that, you still have to do Khamsu? So if, at, so if you made 50,000 and then at the end of the year you spent all that 50, yeah. no, no Khams applies. It only applies if you've made a profit. What about um, if you receive a gift and you don't use it? Is that kind of exactly. So it's not only income. Anything you get throughout the year, anything that you get other than inheritance money. Inheritance money, there's no Khams on it. We have a specific had ruling that states that. So any gift that you get, any grant that you get throughout the year and you did not spend it or use it, let's say you got clothes you did not use, you got perfume, cologne you did not use, at the end of the year khums applies to it. You're liable to, to pay one-fifth of its estimated value because technically you received something and you didn't use it. So that's not an expense. Those pair of shoes that you got as a gift and you did not use throughout that year, even once or twice, right? That's not an expense. So if they're worth $100, you have to pay $20, which is the khums of the value. After one year? Yeah, if one year passes, yes. And all the marja are... Uh, think this end. Yes, yes, they're pretty unanimous on this, yes. You have to have a specific day in your head. Yeah, that's why you have to assign a specific day. Yeah, you, you know, put that in your notes or on a piece of paper, assign. You know, originally, originally the khumus applies to any income you make. So that 50,000, originally you have to pay 10,000, 20% of it. Now the Imams have explained Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it optional for you to exclude your expenses. But that's a favor that God is doing you. Otherwise, originally the khums applies to everything you get. You pay immediately 20% of it. But then the Imams have come and say, you don't have to do that. You can if you'd like to, Allah will reward you, but we'll give you a year. If you spend it, you know, of course halal spending, because haram spending is not considered an <laughs> expense in Islamic law. Anything that you spend on yourself, your family, your travels, your food, your clothing, anything that is considered an expense, exclude that from your khums. So that's why you should designate a date and then go by that khums year. And then compare how much did you make this year compared to last year. And then you'll realize if you made a profit or not. So if you didn't make any profit or actually you, you incurred a loss this year compared to last year, then no khums applies. Let's now move on to tradition 2.1.7 on page 25. The chain of this hadith is Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He is one of the teachers of Al Kulaini. He is known as Ibn Bindar. Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Bindar. Al Kulaini narrates many hadiths from him. And Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Khalid reliable scholar and narrator. 
عن عثمان ابن عيسى عثمان ابن عيسى was one of the leaders of the Waqifi sect do you remember the Waqifi sect from last year the science of hadith or this class who, who are the Waqifis exactly the Waqifis were a group of people who when al Imam al Kadhim salam was imprisoned for many years the Imam السلام, became a shaheed, he died in prison, so the next Imam was Al Imam al Rada. They denied the Imamah of Al Imam al Rada. They said, no, he's not the Imam. Al Kadhim is still the Imam, but he went into occultation. He went to Ghayba, into Ghayba, and they claimed that he's technically the Mahdi. Now, what was their motive and incentive? Yeah, I mean, it was Khums, basically. Well, Khums was one category of money, but basically money. Because what happened is, these people were, some of them were representatives of Imam al kadhim during his life. When the Imam السلام, was imprisoned, well people did not have access to Imam al kadhim So if they had any religious dues, zakat, khums, kafaram, anything, any amana that they had to give to the Imam, who did they go to? The representatives of the Imam. So during those 14 years or 7 years when the Imam السلام, was imprisoned, so much money accumulated in the homes of these representatives. They had stacks of money, golden coins and you know, uh, silver coins. When Al Imam Al Kadhim السلام, passed away, he became a shaheed. Greed kicked in and the shaitan played with their heads. Some of them, not all of them. Some of them are like, wait a minute, if we admit that Al Imam al Rada is the Imam, we have to go and we have to take all that money and submit it to Al Imam al Rada. So, what's, how can we take this for ourselves? The best way is to deny that Al Imam al Rada is an Imam. He's not an Imam. So, we don't have to give him any money because he's not the next Imam. We'll just wait for Al Kadhim to appear one day. That way, they confiscated all that money to themselves. One of them was this man, Uthman ibn Isa. So they started this new sect. It became to be known as the Waqafiyya, the stoppers technically, because they stopped at the Imama of Al Imam Al Kadhim. Uthman ibn Isa was one of them, yes. So I know that there were others who also didn't believe in the Imam of uh, Imam Rabbah. And their reasoning was, well, you haven't had a child yet. So was that also the Waqafiyya or was that a different group? And if th did this reasoning help these Waqafiyya prove? There was a group of people who claimed Al Imam al Rada السلام, couldn't be the Imam because if the Imam, if Al Rada السلام, was the Imam, he must have had a son who would continue the Imam because the Imams are 12. They had heard these hadiths from the Prophet. Al Imam al Rada alayhi salam, it took him many, many years to have a son. Initially, he did not have any children. Later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with Al Imam al Jawad. So, some of these people, they came and they said, You know what? You're not the Imam. You don't, have a, you don't have a son. You don't have a child. We're not going to believe in you. Some of them were Waqifis and they just wanted an excuse to deny his Imamah. Because they don't have knowledge of the unseen. How do you know he doesn't have a son? Wait, the day he died and he doesn't have a son, you could make that claim. As long as he's alive and he could have a son, how can you make that judgment? So they unrightfully made that judgment. Some of them were waqifah, some of them were confused people. They really didn't know and they had a doubt. But those confused people did not start a sect. Because as soon as Al Imam Al Jawad was born, everything became clear to them, they went back to their righteousness. Whereas the Waqafiyya, they continued for a while. They continued for a long time. So some of them were just confused people who did not start a new sect. They had like some, you know, real doubts. But many of them were actually Waqafis who just wanted an excuse. I have a follow-up question. Um, I've heard that there are other ways say it. Uh, wouldn't they all technically be from Imam al Jawad? See, we have two Sayyids who are given one name, but technically they come from another Imam as well. The Husseinis and also the who? The Radawis. 
Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We have the Husseinis and the Radawis. Basically, all those Sayyids who are Husseini and they trace their ancestry to Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, they go through who? Which Imam? Imam Zain, Imam Zain al Abidin, because all other sons of Al Imam Al Hussein were killed in Karbala. The only one who survived was Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. But because of the high status of Al Imam Al Hussein, they attribute themselves to Al Imam Al Hussein. Another was the Radawis. The Al Imam Al Rada alayhi salam, the only son whom he had was Al Imam Al Jawad. So all those Sayyids who come from the line of Al Imam Al Jawad are technically, you know, we would call them Taqawis, for example. Al Imam, uh, you know, Al Taqi. He is considered Al Imam Al Taqi in, in just common. Uh, language in many societies. But because Al Imam Al Rada had such a high status and he was much more well known, he, they would attribute themselves to Al Imam Al Rada. In fact, the two Imams who came after Al Imam Al Rada, Al Imam Al Jawad, Al Imam Al Hadi, and even Al Imam Al Askari, they were known in societies, in society at the time, as Ibn Al Rada. That's how most people recognize them as Ibn al-Rada, because Al-Imam al-Rada was very well known due to his relationship with the Ma'moon. He had appointed him as the heir to his throne for a while. So everyone recognized Al-Imam al-Rada. And he had those debates with so many scholars and people. Also put on the coins too, right? Yes, in fact, his name was also put on the coin at the time. Uh, so because he was so well known, it was attributed to them. So Uthman ibn Isa, was one of the leaders of the Waqifi sect. Now, as Shaykh al Tusi, he considers him thiqa. He considers him to, re, to be reliable. Even though he deviated by rejecting the Imama of Al Imam al Rada, but he was known to speak the truth, to be accurate when it came to the ahadith, these technical hadiths that we have. He was known to be truthful. Now, what's interesting about Uthman ibn Isa. At the time of Al Imam al Rada, السلام, the Imam expressed to him his anger with him that you've started this sect and you have deviated. Eventually, he went back to his righteousness, he went back to his, sentence, uh, his senses, and he repented. He repented, he believed in Al Imam al Rada, السلام, and he died as a believer. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually saved Uthman ibn Isa. But the next Narrator whom he narrates from? No, he had an evil fate. An Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ani. Ali ibn Abi Hamza was even a greater uh, companion who started this Waqafiyya sect. He played a greater role. Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ani stayed on his devious path, he never repented. And when he died, Al Fadl ibn Shadan is one of the greatest companions of Imam al Rada. Very righteous, very reliable. Al Fadl ibn Shadan narrates, he says, I saw Ali ibn Musa al Rada raise his hand in Qunut, praying to Allah. And he prayed, he made a dua against Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ani. I asked him what happened. He told him, Now, Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ani died, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala filled his grave with the fire of hell because of his deviation and the so many people that he caused to deviate. And I've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase his punishment because he knowingly rejected us, he lied to the people, and he confiscated all that, all those dues and you know finances from the people. So this was the fate of Ali ibn Abi Hamza al Bata'ani. Was he reliable or not? Scholars have mentioned that before he deviated, he was known to be reliable. After he deviated, we can't trust him anymore, especially since he did not repent. Therefore, many scholars will doubt his hadiths. Meaning we need other clues. We cannot simply rely on the chain of narration. So this is the Senad of this hadith. This hadith is a very, very important hadith. We'll examine it next time because there is so much to discuss in it. The Imam السلام, in this hadith talks about tafaqquh fi What does that mean? 
What is the verse that we have in the Holy Quran? This requires a detailed discussion. So we will defer this to our next class, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.